There we go. Looks like the first time you've seen that happen in public, right? Okay, there we go. Well, friends, I have two things I need to apologize for. First off, um, for the glare. That's, uh, I got that from my dad, and uh, of all the things I could have gotten, that's what he chose me to have. Second off, I'm not actually advertising for Mac here. The, um, in Zambia, we, um, it's easier to actually get uh, to, to charge your devices and to charge iPads and iPhones and computers and things like that than it is to get paper and ink. And so I've been challenged to learn how to preach from a computer or from an iPad or those kinds of things. And so that's what this is. So um, as you know, if you're familiar with computers, as soon as you desperately need them, that's when they decide to restart or they decide to do something. So if you hear me just kind of ramble for a little while, that's probably what's going on is that uh, we're trying to get that restarted. Um, but we are the Hawk family, and I'm going to grab my little zapper from here. We are the Hawk family, my wife, Clorinda, my oldest son, Jonathan. Go ahead and stand up. Um, Levi just left, and Daniel has been in the Sunday school class, probably being asked to sit down about 300 times. Um, but we are, we are from, my wife and I, we're all from uh, Anchorage, Alaska. Actually, we're from Michigan. We've lived in Anchorage, Alaska since the early 2000s. Um, there I served as an associate pastor. I was actually saved through ministry there. Um, came to be a youth pastor, associate pastor at Diamond Boulevard Baptist Church. And uh, um, seven years after that, God called us into ministry to Zambia, Africa. And so I'm going to share some of that this morning very briefly. A little bit about Zambia. If that, oh, the O-N button. And there we go. Okay. So we are the Hawk family. And I just want to start by saying that I am so grateful um, that God had chosen to put uh, this particular group together. Um, as, I, as I see across ministry and I see how important family is uh, in ministry to allow um, the, the guy who stands up front to have any success whatsoever, um, first off, but the, grace of the grace of God. And one of the ways that he implements that is by the family that surround him. And so I just I, I want to publicly uh, give praise to the Lord for, his, for my family. Um, my wife has been, is just an absolute incredible support. Uh, my son, Jonathan, oftentimes does uh, um, a lot of the electronic stuff and works through the PowerPoints and does the pictures and a lot of that kind of stuff, you know, so very, very involved. Um, all three of the sons, by uh, uh, Levi oftentimes is taking care of Daniel so that we don't have to. Um, but then Levi and Jonathan, um, at the end, when we're all done and we're getting ready to leave, I won't have to double check any of the things back there. They'll grab my computer. They'll put everything away. They'll, they'll store everything right where it needs to go. Um, and it's just, it's just such an incredible encouragement to have them as part of this ministry. Um, the, uh, um, one of the things that I took from our, our, associate, or our senior pastor in Alaska was his family and how his family was involved in ministry. Um, and that it wasn't his ministry that his family went to. It was their ministry together. And uh, that, that's how we see this ministry. God has called our family uh, to Zambia, Africa, to, be, to share the gospel there with the people of Zambia. Um, you're going to see uh, right there we have reaching, uh, right there, <laughs> I'm not used to this, um, reaching Zambia, Africa in word or deed. And we're going to talk about that, that text this morning, Colossians chapter 3. Um, as we get into what we're going to be doing. Now, this is a little bit of a cheat. I'm not going to stay on this one very long because later I'm going to ask you where it's at. South central portion of the continent of Africa is Zambia. Um, now, a little bit about Zambia. It's a, uh, it is primarily, primarily an English-speaking nation. By its constitution, it is an English-speaking nation. What that means is that, um, that in the main capital, um, documents, things like that, are all written in English. What it does not mean, however, is that the majority of the people speak English. Um, the, majority of the, 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 the majority of the people speak one of three languages. Um, where we're going to be on the eastern side, which is a border town to Malawi, they speak the language of Nyanja. Um, and so there they would say, Moka Bwanji, or good morning. Um, and so we're, go we're working on that language right now. And they're also a Christian nation. <coughs> Excuse me. But what that means, basically, is that they're not Muslim. Um, it has nothing to do with the gospel. It has nothing to do with the word of God. It simply means that Muslims are not necessarily welcome. The Islamic faith is not welcome uh, in Zambia. That's what it means by Christian nation. What it does mean, however, is that we are able to stand up with the word of God in a public area. I can actually go to a public high school with the word of God and proclaim, thus saith the Lord, from the word of God, without apology, with all the boldness that, that the Lord allows me to have, uh, without fear of retaliation from the government of things, because they are listed as an, as an American, or as a, an English or a, a, a Christian country. That being said, it leads us to what we're going to be talking, a little bit of what we'll talk about very briefly. Um, anyone who claims not to be Muslim can also do the same thing. 
Um, so if you're Mormon, if you are Catholic, if you have a, a denomination, if you believe some, a, a faith structure, if you will, that doesn't line up with the word of God, um, you can also teach that because you're not, you're not Muslim. And so it does lend itself to a lot of confusion. It lends itself to a lot of, um, a, a lot of confusion among new believers and among people who might come to know Christ. Um, but it's a country that has a lot of physical needs as well as very many um, spiritual needs. Uh, nearly one in three fam families are affected by the HIV or the AIDS virus. Um, and that contributes to an incredibly high infant mortality rate. Uh, infant mortality rate there is roughly 200 babies by the age of five per 1,000 babies born. Um, in some cases, they don't even name their children until they're a little bit older in some of the more remote villages because they're gonna, they, until they live to a certain age, uh, then they go ahead and give them a name because death is such a common, common occurrence there. Um, HIV and AIDS also is a high contributor to uh, the incredibly high uh, uh, orphan population that's there with a population of, of 700,000 orphans in a country of 14 million people. Now to give you an idea what that, how that translates to America as we look at our, um, our society here, we have roughly 320 million people, we have roughly 400,000 orphans. So what that translates to is a concentration of nearly 50 times that of the United States. So if you're gonna be involved in ministry, if you're gonna be involved in sharing the gospel uh, in Zambia, it's gonna have a large part, um, orphan work uh, is gonna have a large part of that, of that ministry. One of the ways that we're going to be doing that is working with this group here called Hope of Glory. Um, these guys here are the one in the middle with the black, uh, the, the black sweater. Um, he's actually, his name is Harrison Bonda. He's, an, he's an, uh, um, a Zambian national, was raised by American missionaries uh, in Zambia, came to America, went to college, is now back as a missionary to his own people there in Zambia. We'll be teaming with him um, as well as another uh, couple that's there as we, as we share and as we learn the language and as we uh, go out of Zambia there. Uh, but one of the ways that they work with the orphans and the widows um, is uh, they, uh, the, actually I'll talk more about that uh, later. Make sure you ask me that question for the sake of time. How exactly they do, uh, they work with widows and orphans. They have another very important portion of their, their ministry there, which is being an inter-country mission agency. Um, what they want to, they understand the importance of nationals reaching or Zambians reaching Zambians. And so um, one of the goals we have is by sharing the gospel, by teaching uh, um, deep theology, by teaching true doctrine so that these men are equipped, able to leave where they're at and go out and start churches capable of, of uh, um, preventing some of what you'll see uh, as we go through the, the last couple of slides here. Can you move to the next slide? It's not, there we go. Um, this is Granny, um, and again, for the sake of time, she's one of the widows there that was helped. And then also we have the next slide there is, um, is some of the orphans that are there. They're actually working with the guys of Hope of Glory, helping them to build a church that's in the village of Makungwa. Um, and I can't wait to tell you a little bit about that as well. Um, they're actually helping to build the church, working hand in hand with the men of Hope of Glory as they're learning how, to, how, to, how a Christian man lives, how a Christian man interacts with his wife, how a Christian man interacts with his community. So in addition to supplying needs and things like that, they also um, just live with, the, with these kids, um, teaching them and are godly examples to them. Um, there we go. One of the other areas we'll be ministering in is the prison ministry. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with that for the sake of time, but what I will tell you is that prison life in Zambia is much, much more difficult than we see prison life in the United States. Um, for instance, the clothes that these guys have on are probably what they're arrested in, regardless of how long ago they were, they were arrested. So if you're in prison for 12 years and you have one shirt, chances are you have one shirt 365 days a year for 12 years. Um, and so one of the ways that we'll be coming alongside of them, providing uh, medication, providing clothing, providing some of the physical needs that these men have, and then when they ask the question that I kept hearing over and over when I was there, why would you leave what they refer to America as heaven on earth to come here and, and, and help us? We are allowed to say because our God gave everything for us. Our God loved us enough to die for us, gave his only begotten son for us, and he's asked us to do the same, and so that's what we're here doing is showing you love, showing you God's love, and providing things for you so that we might have an opportunity, so you might have an opportunity one day to spend an eternity with him. So we'll be doing that through the prison ministry as well as the ladies and the men's ministries. My wife is a very accomplished uh, seamstress, and we'll be um, teaching ladies um, some, some uh, business models on how to, how to put together their own businesses. Uh, a lot of the ladies there, as a result of um, the poverty level, have had to move to what we'll just refer to as inappropriate means in order for them to earn a living and provide for their children or send their children to school, things like that. Um, but simply by learning how to sew and putting together a small business, they can earn the same amount of money 
um, to, uh, to leave that lifestyle um, and one day maybe have an opportunity for them to be able to glorify the, the Lord uh, with what they've learned. And so my wife will be using that as an avenue to have ladies' Bible studies and share the gospel with them. I'll be doing the same thing with the men that are there as we teach uh, mechanicing and welding and, and some of those kinds of things as well. This might be the most heartbreaking um, slide in the, in the presentation. Um, uh, it's actually supposed to say reformed, but reformed church in Zambia. Now, when we hear the word reformed, oftentimes we think, you know, the great reformers. We may think, you know, Martin Luther. We may think, we may think more modern. We may think John MacArthur or Steve Lawson. Um, different names come to mind. But as we see reformed church in Zambia, what they're actually talking about is that it is a reformed church, meaning this church, the arrow that the, is pointing at, used to be a fundamental Bible teaching, gospel preaching church. Um, the, a missionary had gone in, started that church. It was a very f uh, fundamentally sound church. However, there was not a lot of doctrine and depth taught to the people that were there. And when the missionary left, um, the, the man who was appointed in this case, he was, appointed, he was given a, a Bible. He was, uh, they bought him a hymnal, and he was then the pastor. That was his qualifications. He was a Christian. He had a Bible and a hymnal. That made him the pastor. Um, so very, very shortly, it, it didn't take very much time at all for other groups to come in and creep in, creep in unawares, as Jude talks about, and completely corrupt. It is now an ultra, ultra hyper uh, charismatic um, uh, uh, church there. Um, I'll use that term loosely, church. Um, to give you a very brief example, we had gone to a Bible study very similar to this church here. The pastor who was up there was screaming things like this. He said, by his stripes, we've been healed physically, and he will cure your AIDS, and he will cure your cancer, and he will heal your families. By his stripes, we've been healed financially. He will take care of your poverty. If we will claim these promises, he will make everything work well for you. He, uh, they were going through testing at the time. He said, by his stripes, we've been healed mentally, and he will give you an A on your test. If you will, uh, and this was what they were, they were proclaiming. They happened to ask Pastor Harrison if he would come and speak. He's a well-respected man in the area. They asked him if he would come to speak, so he said, I would love to. So he came up and he, the first question he had was, what are the different ways to get to heaven? And the men who were, had been teaching earlier, um, they began to give him answers. These are the pastors of this church. They began to give answers like this, by not cheating on my wife, by being faithful on my taxes, by being loyal to the Zambian government. Those were the answers that these pastors, if you will, were giving to the people who in some cases had walked six or eight miles one way to get there. And when they got there, that's what they heard. God used that time to really show us why he's called us to Zambia. Because they need the truth of the word of God. Not just, not just the simple gospel as we think of it, but they need the entire counsel of the word of God so that the leadership, so the people can stand firm, um, faithful, to the, faithful to the truth of the word of God. Um, one of their favorite things is, is soccer, as I'm sure you're aware of, um, and we're going to be using that. Uh, Harrison, what used to be uh, an uh, assistant coach on the national Zambian soccer team. Um, I personally can't stand soccer, um, but I'm pretty good at putting together brackets. And so um, I'm going to be doing that portion. He'll be doing this and using this as an opportunity to, um, to reach many children there uh, with the gospel. We, were, we had asked a missionary that came to our church and was talking about Zambia long before we were going to go. Um, what are some physical things that you need? I know you need prayer. I know you need support. I can't go to Walmart and buy those. What are some things that you need? He said, if we had enough uniforms to field two soccer teams, we could have 400 kids come for a soccer event, in which case we could have a chance to share the gospel, 400 kids at one time. And so we're excited to be able to use soccer um, as an opportunity to share the gospel as well. But um, the, you know, we're called to go into every nation and preach the gospel. We're, go we're called, every one of us are called to go into the every nation um, and, and share the truth of the word of God to those people that are around us or to go where there's other people and share the gospel. And all of those things that we're, do, we're to do, we're to do in the Lord's name as his ambassador, as his representatives, we're to do those things as Christ would call us to do it. The fact is, is every one of us in this room, if we call ourselves believers, if we are children of God, we are ambassadors. And the question is, is whether or not we're good ambassadors, whether or not we give a, a true testament to what, who, who the person of Christ is. But we are the Hawk family and and uh, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about, we, I had mentioned that the, the, our, our um, statement comes from Colossians chapter 3, and that's where we're going to spend the rest of the time this morning um, in uh, Colossians chapter 3. Before we get there, I would like to open a word of prayer as we uh, look into the word of God. Dear Father, you are a, a great and a mighty God, and it is such an incredible honor, Lord, to be able to call you master. Lord, it is so humbling to be able to be your servant to be able to live our lives with the purposes and desires to glorify and honor you. 
Lord, I pray that as we, as we look into your word this morning, as we see um, the truth come out in the word of God, Lord, that we would be faithful to respond to that, that we would be faithful to leave here today um, better equipped and uh, with, with the kind of courage that we need to proclaim the gospel to the people that you've placed around us. It is such an honor to be able to call you Savior, to be able to call you Lord. It's in your name we ask. Amen. Uh, we're going to be talking, like I said, from Colossians chapter 3 this morning. Um, I'm not going to read the entire text, but I'll read it as we go through. Um, but God used this passage a lot in our life as, as we were looking at getting into and changing gears, if you will, to getting into ministry. Um, just very briefly, my wife and I's testimony, my wife came to know the Lord while she was actually a student at Word of Life Bible Institute in Scream Lake, New York, having grown up in a Christian home with a, a dad who was a pastor and very involved in church, really believed that she was a child of God, and it was through uh, um, working through the, the book of Romans that she came to know Christ as her Savior. Um, I was also uh, raised later, or um, come to know Christ later in life, but I was also raised in a Christian home, very active Christian home. Um, and it wasn't until I was 30 years old, through the testimony of a, a couple of faithful teens, um, that God used that time to call me to himself. And very shortly thereafter, God began to give us a, a passion to read his word and to share his word and to be involved in the ministry, um, to be involved in teaching other teens and teaching other people how to share the, uh, the gospel of those people around us. And any time we would come to struggles, any time we would have um, conflicts in our, of our thought process, God would bring us back to this passage here. Um, but first off... Um, he had given us a desire to glorify him. He had given us a desire to honor him, to, to, um, to glorify him with our life, with our actions, with things that we did. And Psalms 37.4 is a passage that I'm sure you're all familiar with, can probably quote it with me. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Um, now, I personally, when I first heard that verse, I thought that meant if I go to church a lot, I'm getting a Harley. Um, that's not actually not what that verse meant. I came, to, I came to learn later. But my wife and I desired to honor the Lord. We, delight, we, we desired to delight in the Lord. We wanted him to be um, our sole purpose for, for uh, going through this life. And uh, as I began to see God calling us into ministry in some capacity, I, I told him, I said, I don't know where God wants to use me. I don't know where God wants to use us. Um, but I know that we're called to something we, we, he, he's want, he wants us to, to obey, and I have no idea where to go from here. He goes, well, where do you want to be used? I already told the teens this morning. I said, well, there's only two places I don't want to be used. I do not want to be involved in music, and I don't want to work with teens. So fast forward a couple of years, and I was a youth pastor and a song director at Diamond Boulevard Baptist Church <laughs> in Anchorage, Alaska. Now, um, again, I shared with the teens that, that uh, I, I don't say that just because um, it sounds funny. I'm not one of those guys that says, um, tell God your plans so he can laugh at you. I'm not, I'm not one of those guys. The reason I bring that up is because it proves this verse to its ultimate degree here. He said, delight, also, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And he gave us the desires of our heart by changing our heart to want the things that he wanted. And he so graciously gave us something that we could be passionate about, gave us a group of people that we could fall in love with and fall in love with ministry with and then be able to use that to serve and honor him. And so it, it proves the, 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 this, this verse. Our life is a testament to the truth of the word of God. Um, he changed our heart to want the things that he wants. Um, as, we, as we began to study and as we began to learn, again, it became very, very um, uh, evident that God was leading us into some sort of ministry. Um, we began to work with the teens. We began to work with, um, in the Awana program, and some of those, and eventually became, uh, became a, the associate pastor and youth pastor uh, there at Diamond. And God used this passage here. And he begins with a very powerful statement. He, he begins in verse 1. He says, If then ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Now, just to give you a little bit of a background here, just very briefly, um, Paul, is, is, as he moves into chapter 3, has spent chapter 1 and 2 talking about doctrine. He's been talking about the truth of the Word of God, a lot of the things that are kind of fundamental and foundational to, uh, to the truth of the Word of God. And as he gets into chapter 3, he's talking about kind of our response to those things. Um, so at first he's talked about doctrine, now he's moving into duty. Um, this is how we ought to respond now that it, once we call ourselves, once we are believers in Christ. He says, If then ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. That word if in some translations says because, or could be translated since, to, be, to say this, since you have been raised with Christ. Right? Because you have been raised with Christ. He, then he says, to, um, um, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He then says to set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. Now, if you read those two verses together, it sounds kind of repetitious. 
Um, it sounds, why would God um, say the same thing two times? Both of this, you know, seeking the things that are above. And, and it, to me, it, I, I thought, I don't really get it. But what we have to understand is kind of the culture of that day. Um, at this time, there was very little connection between what a person believed and, what a, and how a person responded to that. There wasn't, you know, a, a worshiper of, I don't know, Baal. Their life wasn't in accordance with, for the most part, with that kind of worship. That was in this box. They did all the ceremonial things they were supposed to do, and then they lived life completely separate. And what Paul is talking about here is that there is to be, that our life is to be affected by the fact that we call ourselves children of God, that we have been saved by, by, by an almighty Lord. Um, our life has to be affected by that. And that's kind of what he's talking about here. But he uses this, he says, um, since we have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, and then focus on those things. And it, the, the analogy would be this. Um, do we have anybody that's ever done any bow hunting? Anybody? We got one? Let me ask you this. I'll call you on the spot here. Um, would it be a, considered a, a, a successful bow hunt? You get up in the morning, you paint your face all up, you put your camo, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, you tramps across the woods, you climb up into the tree, you get everything all ready. The deer comes walking out, you see it, you draw on it, it begins to walk away, and it gets out of sight, and you put the, the arrow back in the quiver, and you put your bow away, and you go back to the house. Is that considered a successful hunt? Of course not. If that's how you hunt, you're going to starve. You have to let go of the arrow. You have to let go of the arrow. And that's kind of what he's saying here. It's the idea of moving in that direction. Know where it is that God has called you to go and then head that direction. Know what it is, focus on the things that are above, and then move that way. See, it's not, good, it's not enough just to know what the Word of God teaches. If we're not doing anything with it, how often do we hear that theme throughout Scripture? How often do we hear that about not just being hearers of the Word, but being doers? And that's a lot of what, uh, what, what he's talking about here. He's saying that because you have been raised with Christ, your life should be affected by that, and this is how. Um, and then he gets into the kind of the why our life should be affected by that as he moves into uh, verse 3 and 4. He says, For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your, your life, shall appear, then you shall appear with him in glory. This is an incredibly precious truth that, that, that Paul is sharing here. He's not just giving a list of instructions. He's not just saying, this is how you ought to live because you're a Christian. He's also given a why and then a what's coming. And it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, testimony that he's talking about here. He's not just saying, you have to do this because you're a Christian, and that's how it is. What he's saying is that you, you, your life is affected because you are a Christian, because Christ died for you, because, as you move on to, to verse 4, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then we shall what? Appear with him in glory. Right? What, a, what an incredible, the, the message that Paul is sharing is precious. God, Christ not only died for us as our substitute, but we died with him as our identification. He not only died for sin, breaking its penalty, he died unto sin. He broke its power. Um, and what that means is that we can have, as, as we're called to live a life that honors the Lord, we can have victory over the old nature that wants to control us. We can have victory over the sin nature that wants to call us in that direction. Um, we can live the life that God has called us to live because of the death and the resurrection of his son. Um, Romans 6, 2, how can we who have died to sin still live in it? We can have victory over that sin. As believers, we have been raised with Christ because, we have, because of the sacrifice of our Savior. We can have victory over sin. And what he's talking about here, this is a message of hope. It's a message of victory. It's a message of encouragement uh, to these people. And then he moves on to the incredible words of verse 4 again. He says this, When Christ, who is your life, shall appear, then you shall appear with him in glory. I mean, think about that. Think about that. Think back to 1 Thessalonians 4. Uh, that we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I mean, we've been raised with Christ. What an incredible thing for believers to think about, amen? What an incredible thing. We've been raised with Christ. We're to seek the things that are above, not below. We're to set our minds on those things. We're to move into that direction because we have died. Our life is now hidden with Christ. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we shall appear with him in glory. How do believers not get excited about that? How do believers go through their life without this incredible passion to share the gospel because of the truth of that? What an incredible reality. And I would love to spend the rest of the morning talking through the rest of this passage, but we'll have to go through lunchtime tomorrow um, to get through it correctly. Um, but as we go on, Paul begins to describe some of the things that need to be removed uh, from our life, some of the evidence um, that needs to be removed from our life. And in verse 5, he uses the word mortify. He says this, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. 
fornication, uncleanliness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, which is evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience, into which ye also walked some time when ye, wa when ye believed in them, or when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all of these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. But he begins to talk about some of the, some of the, things that most of that people struggle with in our day and those things that are being removed from our life but he uses an interesting word here he uses the word mortify he doesn't just say remove he says mortify that's an action word that's an idea that's a there's there's an action that takes place i was listening to a sermon one time that was on uh, part of this passage and the title of the sermon got my attention it was called spiritual suicide that grabbed my thoughts i thought i gotta hear what this guy's talking about um, but what he was talking about was that the idea that mortify is an intentional action. It's, um, we oftentimes, we, when we become believers, we're often taught, or sometimes we just normally think, that once I come to Christ, that all the struggles are going to go away. Well, the reality is, is once we come to Christ, that's not going to happen necessarily. We're, there's, we're going to fail. We, and we see ourselves sometimes as failures. We see ourselves as, I, I must not be saved. You, know, you go through this whole gamut of, of, of thoughts. The reality is, is that just because we've come to Christ doesn't mean that all those struggles are going to go away now. Just be, you know, um, I was a, a relatively heavy alcoholic before I came to know Christ. The day after I came to know Christ, I still struggled with alcohol. I was, a, you know, I, I, we, we have uh, sins prior to salvation. We have tendencies prior to salvation. At the moment of salvation, those things aren't necessarily just wiped out. But what is there is the ability to overcome through, the, through the, the working of the Holy Spirit in our life. We now can have victory over those things. Before, I was helpless to, to conquer those things. But Christ has now given us the ability through salvation to have victory in those things. Um, because, uh, uh, but the, the verse is to mortify, as, as some say, to put to death that which is earthly in you. Um, now I want to be really clear. Christ has already given victory over sin through the death and the resurrection of his son. Um, and so we can have victory over sin. But what Paul is telling these people is to know it, to act on it, to move on it, do it with, emerg with, with urgency, to understand that this is, um, um, the, the, um, um, when, when we are saved, we're to kill those things in our life that are focused on these things that are above. And Paul continues talking about, and he talks about some of the other areas and sin and wrath and anger and malice and all those kinds of things. But then he moves into verse 10. So first off, he talks about these things ought to be removed. First, we're focused on the things that are above because we are risen with Christ. We're to remove those things in our life that ought not to be there, and then we're to replace them with these things. These things ought to be now evident in our life. In verse 10, to, uh, 10 and 11, he says this, And we have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. What he's saying is that there's no national distinction, um, Jew or Greek. There's no, there's no religious prerequisites, circumcision or uncircumcision. There's no uh, cultural distinctions, barbarian, Scythian. There's no social distinctions, bond or free. What he's saying is that in Christ, all these distinctions are removed. Why, do we, why, do, why does he bring this up? Well, I want to say this. Oftentimes in our, in, in our society, maybe it's the way we were raised, maybe it's an American thing, who knows, I think it's just a human thing. Um, we often like to point at our history, we often like to point at our culture, we often like to point at our heritage to be able to uh, excuse actions or struggles that we have. How often have we heard this, and I hope I don't offend anybody individually, I'm Irish, I have a temper. You know, we, we hear things like that all the time. And we like to justify the sin that's in our life because of whatever has happened before. But think back to the beginning part of this passage. We are dead. Our life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then we'll appear with him in glory. All those things, all those reasons, all those excuses, all those reasons that we can't live a holy, upright life before the Lord because of who we are or who our parents were are gone. Which means all of us here are equal with the ability to follow after the Lord because we all have the same Holy Spirit living in us. We are all of us that are children of God have been raised with him. We are, we are raised with him. And he encourages these people to put on this new life. And, you know, you see this theme um, all, through, you know, all throughout Scripture. It's a familiar theme. Um, Galatians 5 talks about it. You know, as we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Um, we talked about that in Sunday school this morning. 1 John talks about it. Romans 5 talks about it. Ephesians 5. 
It goes on and on and on about our life being affected, the, the evidence in our life portraying the fact that we are believers, that our life should be affected by our salvation. It's a very common theme throughout all of Scripture. And now Paul is saying now to, to put on a lot of those same things that we read about earlier in Scripture um, or later as well. And then he continues there into verse 16 and 17. He says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Sorry, I just lost my place. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. You may ask, why would this missionary get up and talk about this? This is not a missionary passage. There, nowhere in this passage does it say go. It doesn't talk about necessarily sharing the gospel specifically. Why would that be this? Well, I would say this, because God used this passage in the life of my wife and I to, to get our, our mind right, if you will. What I mean by that is this. We had a very, very comfortable life in Alaska. We loved living in Alaska. Um, we, we, we loved being in the ministry there. We loved the church family that, that we were with. Um, I loved serving as, a, as, a, as an associate pastor, a youth pastor. I thought it was a wonderful place to be. Um, our, our, our children had wonderful godly chil- uh, friends there at the, at the church. Um, they had, a great, they had uh, a great activities that they were able to be involved in at the church. That a number of teens in the youth group had begun Bible college. Some of them have begun uh, um, going on to be pastors. One of them has uh, just got married, getting ready to be a pastor. Um, we were looking at purchasing a home. We had found a home that was very uncommon in Alaska to be able to find one that's large enough to have youth activities inside of the house and a backyard big enough to have a volleyball thing and at an affordable rate it was it's very very uncommon to find we thought we had found one church had just given us a a, a, a salary increase we had found a vehicle that we absolutely loved that was new to us um, it was old but it was new to us um, and we absolutely loved it things were going exactly the way that we wanted them to go in ministry when we drew up how we would want youth ministry to take place it was it this matched where it was that God wanted us to be, and we loved it. We were passionate about it. Um, we had no desire to ever leave. But God began to call us out of that, and it was a very difficult thing to, to even consider. Um, God gave us the passion to working with those teens. God gave us the passions for that ministry, um, and now it felt like he was pulling us away from that, and I didn't want to do that. Now, it's not that we were ultimately so involved with, you know, as it talked about the the hatred and things that are in, in the earlier verses. It's not that we were involved with those things, but our willingness to be faithful to him was based on the comforts that we had in this life. It was, we were no longer focused. The, the first part of the passage says this, because I'm a child of God, I have to focus on the things that are above. Not my comfort here. It wasn't wrong to have a, a good youth group. It wasn't wrong to be, to be involved you know, in, in church activities. It wasn't wrong for our kids to have Christian friends. It wasn't wrong to see these, these teens go off to Bible. You know, those things, none of those things were wrong until they began to cause us to not be faithful today. Then they were a problem because now they were the reason that we weren't being faithful anymore. And so God used this passage again. If then, John, you're risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And the admonition was really clear to me. Because I'm a child of God. It's my responsibility. I have a requirement on my life. I have a privilege on my life to focus on eternity rather than the temperate. To focus on the things that God has me doing later, not just today. Um, It's not within my rights to focus on the things of this world. It's not within my rights as a believer to focus on the things that make me comfortable and make that a priority as a child of God. And it was in reading that passage there that the words of Jim Elliot came to mind that we're all probably familiar with. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. As it relates to our call to missions, like I said, God used this passage to sort of get our mind right, as it were. We've been called, because we've been risen with Christ, to seek those things which are above, to focus on the things that are eternal, to honor him with our lives and to do that faithfully regardless of where where it is that he's called us. We desire to honor him, to delight in him, to glorify him with our lives. Our goal is to reach the people of Zambia and as we travel across the country to reach others as well. Um, That's our goal but we we ultimately want to honor the Lord with our life. My challenge to you is, is 
it's easy to get stagnant. If you're a believer here, it's easy to get stagnant doing what it is that you're doing right now and just kind of close the doors to where God may have, have you go. It doesn't mean, mean necessarily that he may have you pack up your suitcases and move to Africa. Um, we've been called, every single one of us have been called to go into every nation and preach the gospel. We've been called to um, Jerusalem, Samaria, to the other, you know, we've been called to, those, to, to, to do those things. We've been called locally. We've been called globally to share the gospel. Um, you that are involved in, in activities and things, you are in the position that your pastor can't get to. You're in a position that I can't get to, that only you can get to. And I'm here to tell you that your faithfulness in sharing the gospel, the people that God has placed around you, is no less God-honoring than the missionary who goes overseas or the pastor who stands before you on Sundays. It, those are all just simple obedience. It isn't more glorious, it doesn't honor God more that we would move to Africa than it does that you would be faithful at your, at your place of employment. It doesn't honor God more that you would be faithful to stand up in front of the pulpit and preach, uh, preach to a congregation than it does for you to be faithful in your high school sharing the gospel with the people that, you placed, that God has placed around you. Your pastor stands before you and preaches the gospel out of obedience to his Lord. That's where the honor comes. You are faithful to your Lord by sharing the gospel with the people that God has placed around you. Now, you may, God may call you to Africa. If so, I've got a, we'll, we'll have a bed open for you. <laughs> We'd love to have you come. Um, but God has called each and every one of us. And the fact is, is that it's, it is a command to do that. To not be faithful is sin. To not share the gospel isn't just living a poor lifestyle. It's not just being a backslidden Christian. It's sin. Because God has told us to do that. And to not do that is to defy what he's called us to do. But we also have a God, as I shared in Sunday school this morning, we have a God who is faithful and just if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of those sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, give us an opportunity to be faithful before him again. I want to say this, though, is if you're here this morning and there's never been a time in your life where you've received Christ as your personal Savior, there's never been a time in your life where you've recognized the fact that you are completely hopeless before an almighty, perfect God, if there's never come a time in your life where you have surrendered your life to that God and said, take me, Lord, forgive me. I can't earn salvation on my own. I throw myself on the mercy of you. I know that you love me, that you died for me, that you rose again. Save me. Allow me to be your child. If you've never come to a point in your life where you've had that conversation with the Lord, I would beg you not to leave here this morning. Don't walk out of these doors without talking to your pastor, finding me. We would love to take the word of God and be able to share with you how you can know that you are a child of God. How, you're, how, how you can be risen with Christ. Believer, if you're here and you're not, you're not sharing the way that God has called us to, to share, I, I beg you, don't leave today doing the same thing that you did yesterday. Be faithful today. I asked the teens in Sunday school as we close, I asked the teens in Sunday school, I said, how many of them, if you don't mind, raise your hand, how many, how many of you were led to the Lord specifically by a missionary or a pastor? One. Two, it's a congregation of 100 people, something like that. Two or three. You know what that means? That means that the majority of the people in this room that know Christ were led to, the, led to the Lord by somebody other than a missionary, a pastor. We tend to think of evangelism as inviting our friends to church so that the pastor can share the gospel with them. But no, only two or three people in this room were led to the Lord that way. The command is for us to go into our communities to go into our places of work, to go into our schools, to go across the country, wherever it is that God has called us, that's the command. Your, your pastor comes up, equips you. The leadership of the church equips you to know how to do that, and then your responsibility is to walk out the doors into the mission field and share the gospel with your own community. So I would challenge you and encourage you to do that. Um, if there's anything that we can pray for you about, we have prayer cards in the back. Um, there's a prayer letter sign up back there. Um, send us, send it, you know, we, we would love to be able to pray for you. Um, one of the ways that we are in, uh, trying to encourage our children as we go through is being able to have um, some people that, that, that write, you know, God, I, I'm struggling with this right here. Can you pray for us? And I'm able to show them, look, this person is struggling with this, and this is how God answered that prayer. And God is active across the globe. We would beg you, put the prayer request down. How can we pray for you? Um, how can we be involved in your ministry as you continue to pray for us? But, uh, dear Lord, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you for the precious gift of salvation, for the incredible opportunity and privilege that you've allowed us to have to stand before people and share the gospel, be that in our workplace, be that at a church, be that in our schools. Lord, I, I pray that we would have the boldness required, that we, would, that we would desire to honor you more than we 
fear others. That we'd be faithful to share the gospel. We talked this morning, as we, we think about today, the fact that we live in a free country because of um, uh, ultimately your sovereignty, but, but uh, as, as soldiers have been used as your tools to accomplish your will, um, we live in a country that allows us to share without fear of retaliation or governmental um, restriction. Um, but as we talked about this morning, Lord, we know that that day uh, may very soon be coming to an end. Um, we live in a country now, Lord, that uh, many people are actively trying to take those uh, abilities away. Lord, encourage us now. Give us the, the boldness. Allow us to be bold to share it, to share the truth, to be faithful when, when we have in a country that allows us to because we know that the time is near when it probably won't be. Teach us faithfulness now, Lord. Let us be obedient in it, in your name.